Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Ron Latz, joins me right now to talk about the hearing. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. My pleasure, Julie. Senator, let's begin. The, the big question here is, that was brought up in the hearing, can you lock someone up for a crime they haven't yet committed? It seems to be the heart of the issue with treatment being the linchpin. This was according to Justice Magnuson. Now, in Minnesota, the argument is that no one is treated and no one gets out if civilly committed. Do you concur with this? Well, history has sort of proven that to be the case so far. And we've had the civil commitment process for, you know, well, many, many years, but uh, most intensively with the high volume of population for the last 20 years. And in that time, only one person has gotten out. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that seems to be the case right now. So the question is constitutionally, without real treatment and without real progress, uh, can we continue to hold them, or is it de facto just a lifetime sentence to prison? What were some of the big red flags that you heard today, some of the key issues that make you think um, you need, they need to be addressed quickly? Uh, well, I think it's important to recognize some of the points that came up in our last discussion that this needs to be compartmentalized. We have a population that's currently about 700 people in the civil commitment system. And the lawsuit that's driving this agenda right now in terms of a time frame is about those people. So no, no matter what we do on the criminal sentencing side, um, if we do anything, uh, it's not going to affect the population that has already concluded their criminal sentence and, and has been committed into the state sex offender program. So we have to make real decisions about the status of that sex offender program, how to ensure that when that persons are properly placed in terms of uh, the level of supervision and care and treatment in that system and that they get regular review and when appropriate they are in fact released. Mr. Chair, let's talk a little bit about those sentencing options. There was a, there were, in the hearing, you heard a little bit about a different blend of civil commitments and other sentencing options that other states do use. For instance, um, identification as a sex offender being placed on somebody's driver's license. Was there anything, and I know it's early, but was there anything that resonated with you? And as we were saying off camera, the, the sentencing portion of this issue wasn't discussed in last year's Senate, um, in, in the bill that passed the Senate. So is this something that you think needs merit and did anything resonate? Well, some of it did. I mean, we have to recognize that we, in, in the Senate or in the Minnesota, we made a lot of very significant changes in sentencing, particularly in response to the 2005 uh, report by the Sentencing Guidelines Commission, when there was a quite a dramatic expansion and lengthening of criminal sentences uh, for sex offenders, particularly the worst of the worst, can now be sentenced to life in prison without the, even the possibility of parole. So I, I personally think we've got a very robust sentencing scheme in place for people who commit crimes now, uh, even based on their past crimes, because they get more credit, if you will, more significance to their criminal history when they're sentenced for new offenses now. So I think we've done a lot there already, and while we can certainly take a look at that, um, I, I don't think that ought to be our most important focus right now. I think there are a variety of opportunities for what we can do when people get released or when people get uh, transitioned from the most secure kinds of facilities uh, to other facilities that still have intense oversight um, and, and uh, supervision. And that could include the options such as what they have right now, which is a 24-7 ongoing GPS system, so we know exactly where they are at every second of the day, ongoing supervision, regular meetings with parole officers and, and, uh, and, and supervisory personnel, um, ongoing treatment, checking in, living in facilities where they have 24-7 uh, personnel that are monitoring their activities and their compliance with the requirements. And those kind of things could also include other check-ins, um, we talk about uh, driver's license monitoring, um, and other techniques that would maintain that level of supervision and control, but recognizing that they're no longer serving a prison sentence. Obviously, public safety is a concern for everybody here in the legislature. How do you, as chair, navigate the concerns of the public with what the federal courts may or may not do if Minnesota doesn't make some changes? Well, I would put it two ways. One is, while the federal courts are driving the timeline right now, we as legislators, and particularly those of us on the Judiciary Committee, have a duty uh, to, to have a system, implement a system that is constitutional. 
uh, that adheres to the constitutional principles, not just a piece of paper because it's the Constitution, because of the principles that they embody. So we have that obligation, just as elected officials, to comply with that. So we'll be taking steps uh, to address those issues. I'm trying to get ahead of the court case, if we can, uh, so that we are, have a system that is constitutional, and that protects the public safety as well as the constitutional rights. Because if we are violating constitutional rights, all of us, in a sense, are less safe and less free. It's fair to say it's a shorter than typical legislative session coming up, and it's fair to say this will be a volatile and fairly political issue. So how do you navigate it through? Are you confident you can get something through in 2014? Well, we're starting a little bit early now. Uh, because we have a shorter policy session, that's why we're having pre-hearings now. We'll have another one in January. Hopefully we'll have legislation ready to go when the legislature reconvenes on February 25th. Um, I think, uh, well, well, we will give this the priority that it needs uh, to move something through. Uh, as we were talking before this interview began, we passed legislation in the Senate um, last year and sent it over to the House, and that's where we believe it is procedurally right now. So part of the, uh, the, the burden right now is on the House to take that up and to do something with it. We'll probably pass some additional legislation to broaden the focus a bit as well. But I want to come back quickly to the public safety part. You know, I've got three kids, two daughters. I care as much as anyone else um, that we have safe neighborhoods, safe streets, and that we're all protected from a safety standpoint. I think there's a way to do that while still being constitutional. And as we learned in the hearing today, sex offenders have a lower rate of committing new offenses of that nature than other criminals, a lower recidivism rate. And with the techniques that we have in place now for monitoring their release into the community, we drive that recidivism rate even lower. Uh, so I think we can do this and protect the public safety and uh, uh, meet our constitutional obligations. Okay, Senator, we'll get deeper into the issue when legislation is introduced. I would like to thank you for your time and also apologize to you and to our audience if you hear any of that background noise. There is, of course, some construction going on here at the Capitol. Very so good. thank you.